Welcome back to John Author's Note. Uh, the UK economy is still in the doldrums. One of the theories that's gaining some traction at the minute is the idea that zombie companies, these are companies that have so much debt they can't afford to invest and expand, are somehow kind of holding the recovery back. Well, there's another theory out there that hasn't had as much attention, which is that perhaps households, you and me, have too much debt that we took on in the boom years and therefore we can't afford to go out and spend money. Uh, I'm joined by Angus Armstrong from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. What do you make of this zombie household thesis? On one side, if we look at the aggregate numbers, net worth of households, that's the assets minus their liabilities divided by their income, has actually risen throughout the whole of the last decade. And mm. so it looks like it, in aggregate they're in a good position. Because if you, if you look at it like a balance sheet, yes, households have taken on a lot of debt, but they have a lot of assets as well because a lot of people have been buying houses, basically. Exactly. So in the last decade, yes, debt uh, more than doubled, but also the real pr value of houses also more than doubled. And so... So why table, should we worry? <laughs> exactly. So there's a, st a school of thought that says, actually, the position is not so bad. The interesting question is that the aggregate numbers can hide people who've got too much debt and not many assets, and people who've got lots of assets and not much debt. And of course, when there's credit problems, there's no way from, for the people with all of the assets to start uh, lending to the people without any of the assets and all of the debt to right. start uh, being able to, to consume. So, so we need to look at the. Issues. So we need to look at the distribution. Should we look at the first chart? This chart shows um, a fairly well-known picture about income inequality in the UK. As you can see, there's two measures. The first one is broad inequality. That's the Gini coefficient. Mm -hmm. And you can see throughout the 1980s that really started to rise and then plateau. And the second one is narrow income inequality, which is the income of the top 1% of households. How much of gross income do they have? Mm -hmm. And you can see it rose to nearly 15% of gross income in the country was earned by 1% of the households. It's really part of a picture of rising inequality over the last uh, 20 years as a backdrop to the economic and, of course, the financial crisis that we've had. Um, now, I can see why we might worry about this politically or even morally, but what's the, what's the kind of economic um, concern about, about this picture and how does it relate to this idea of household debt and, and what's going on sort of beneath the aggregate picture? Well, <clears throat> what's interesting is whether the people who had very strong rising incomes, whether their consumption moved up in line, and the people who didn't have rising incomes, whether their consumption also stayed very low mm -hmm. because if their consumption patterns didn't mirror their income then we get very divergent saving behavior and therefore indebtedness behavior okay and here we have to look at different types of household depending on their income so let's go to the next chart so well, what's this one showing us here we've constructed saving rates um, for households where we've divided the households up depending on the income of each household so we've divided it into five quintiles. And you can see that the lowest quintile... So this is the poorest fifth of the population. Correct. You can see that those households at the lower end of the income distributions are very much the ones that borrowed more and more and more and seem to be very heavily uh, in debt as a response to the, the rising income inequality without changing their consumption behaviour. Right. So they're, so, they're still spent, so they're spending more than they're earning, basically. Yes. They're living beyond their means. And in, they were increasingly so at a faster and faster rate. Now, the interesting question is, how does this happen? Because they have to borrow from somebody. Mm. And this is where the financial dimension of the crisis comes in, because we need to have products which take the savings of the high-income families and allow the borrowings from the low-income families. And of course, this was the period of great financial innovation right. which allowed this to take place. So transferring the savings from the people up here at the top of the chart down to the, the people at the bottom of the chart here. Exactly. And we can think of in the UK, for example, we had um, at the peak of the crisis about 12,000 different types of mortgage product, two-thirds of which were aimed at people with impaired credit. And geographically, we can see that they were mostly sold to the areas where they had the declines in household income. Well, thanks very much for coming in, Angus. So I suppose the, the question is, now that that financial innovation has started to retract, particularly for people at the poorer end of the income distribution, can the, the sort of consumption that we got used to seeing in the years before the crisis ever return to what it was? 